In the early 1980s, Soviet citizens' everyday lives became increasingly difficult due to the worsening economic situation. The main reasons for the economic collapse were an ineffective central planning system, corruption, excessive military spending at the expense of other economic sectors, and provisioning, as well as inefficiency and low productivity. Economic experiments in agriculture, such as reversing river flow into the Aral Sea to irrigate deserts, resulted in environmental catastrophes on an unprecedented scale. Budgetary constraints also led to a fall in educational and healthcare standards. Alcoholism was an endemic problem. In these circumstances, people began to lose their faith in communism. The Warsaw Pact, Comcon, and pro-Soviet Third World countries were also expensive to maintain. A gerontocracy, oligarchal rule by elder statesmen, revealed weaknesses in the USSR's state structures. Leonard Brezhnev's nearly 20 years in power were briefly followed by Yuri Andropov and Konstantin Chernenko. Soviet decision-makers then concluded that the time had come to transfer authority to a younger man, namely 54-year-old Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev embarked on a large-scale state perestroika reform. But plans to rebuild the system had numerous internal contradictions and inconsistencies, particularly economically. The reconstruction of economic and social life was based on several assumptions. Uskoruyenye, namely acceleration, or reform to speed up economic change in the USSR through investments to update the machine and electronic industries. Market mechanisms were also introduced to seemingly give autonomy to state enterprises, but the state and party retained control over the economy. Glasnost, a policy of top-down controlled openness aimed at securing transparency in public life. Gradually lifted censorship turned into open criticism of past and present Soviet governments. It also allowed for the publication of work by formerly banned authors. Western pressure led to the freeing of dissident Andrei Zaharov, who had been exiled with his wife Yelena Bonner since 1980, to Gorky, presently known as Nizhny Novogrod. They came to symbolize the change of Soviet internal policy. Re-emerging human rights organizations such as the Moscow Helsinki Group and Memorial Association started court proceedings to rehabilitate victims of Stalinist purges. New Thinking A non-confrontational policy towards the West was conducted under the slogan of building a common European home. Its essence was a departure from using military threat as a means of achieving political and ideological aims. This policy led to political détente and reduced costs. Democratization Conducted under the slogan, More Socialism, More Democracy, was a change in the CPSU structures to gradually enable real elections to party posts and discussions with the leadership. Yet the very pace of change overwhelmed the party and spurred a grassroots movement for citizens' rights and fundamental freedoms, conscience, religion, speech and free enterprise. The nuclear plant catastrophe in Chernobyl once again clearly revealed the old system's inherent flaws. The authorities covered up the number of victims and scale of fallout in Belarus and beyond the Soviet borders. Over 350,000 people were evacuated from around the power plant. Soviet authorities had sought to keep the incident secret so as not to disrupt the Workers' Day holiday on May the 1st. Yet information about the catastrophe nevertheless became public as brief and superficial coverage, and only after having been reported by Western media. This showed that the Communist Party continued to hold total power and manipulate information despite Gorbachev's assurances of reform. Another problem facing the new leader was the war in Afghanistan, which had started in 1979. The Soviet invasion of this country had led many countries to boycott the Moscow Olympic Games in 1980. Some international public opinion condemned Soviet actions, and the United States provided support to the Mujahideen resistance. Gorbachev eventually withdrew from Afghanistan in 1989. The war's consequences were stark for the USSR, 14,500 killed and 54,000 wounded soldiers, at a cost at today's equivalent of 120 billion US dollars. Power in Afghanistan first passed to the Mujahideen and several years later to the Islamic fundamentalists, the Taliban. The New Thinking policy launched in 1985 led to a series of meetings between leaders of the US and USSR. The Reagan-Gorbachev summits in Geneva, Reykjavik and Washington and a Bush-Gorbachev meeting on the coast of Malta led to agreements on reducing nuclear and conventional weapons in Europe. In exchange, US aid began to flow to the USSR. At the CPSU Central Committee plenum, Gorbachev declared that we need democracy like we need air to breathe. By doing so, he voiced an acceptance of the changes underway in East Central Europe and tacitly encouraged their leaders to conduct reforms. 
this signified a departure from the doctrine of limited sovereignty in relations between Eastern Bloc countries. National leaders, aside from those in Poland and Hungary, reacted in a cautious or negative manner due to their wish to retain power. This new policy was also an attempt by Gorbachev to improve the USSR's international image, and he partially succeeded. The US and Western Europe no longer spoke about an empire of evil, and it was even hoped that the USSR would become a reliable partner in international relations. Stereotypes from the Cold War period gradually disappeared. In response to Gorbachev's reform program, grassroots demands for the reconstruction of the socio-political and economic system began to emerge in the Eastern Bloc, from the Round Table in Poland to East Germany to Czechoslovakia and Hungary. Hitherto, marginalized and repressed opposition circles could apply increasingly more effective pressure on authorities, among which reformers themselves became leaders. 